It is nine o'clock. In fact, I think officially it's one minute past nine. It is Thursday evening and it is time for the very first live stream, 10 years in the making episode of Elephant TV with Julianne Genta and Darcy Angara. Thanks guys for joining me. Thanks for coming on board. I really appreciate you guys jumping on board. This crazy first time we're doing this in a very, very long time. So thank you very much. No worries. All good. Um, so for people who are going to join us, people who are just joining us, uh, Elephant TV was something that um, I started about a decade ago. It was talking about the elephant in the room, uh, the issue in the marketplace that people are talking about and offering different perspectives from that sort of a pseudo debate. It was a debate. It wasn't a debate. It was more of a conversation. Ten years later, we decide that we're going to start this thing up again and we're going to make it more of a structured debate and we're going to host some of the conversations that are happening around New Zealand and around the world, uh, get experts in to talk about it, um, have a proper moot like we used to do when we were in high school. And uh, yeah, people will join in, people will be able to comment, people will be able to uh, um, add to the conversation as well. That's why we're live streaming. If you're watching this in uh, on demand, make sure you go to the Elephant TV Facebook page and like it so you'll know when the next one's coming up. But for those of you who are joining us tonight, thank you for joining us and welcome to the show. Um, what I thought we'd do to start with Julianne and Darcy is just have a look why we have the moot that we have. And the moot that we have tonight is affordable quality housing is a right. The reason we are using that moot in particular is uh, for Julianne and for Julianne's colleagues, that is part of your housing policy for the Greens. Affordable quality housing is a right. No one should have to pay more than 30% of their income for a decent home. Housing New Zealand and community housing tenants should not pay them more, more than 25% of their income on rent. Capital gains tax, excluding the family home, should disincentivize speculative property investment. Only New Zealand citizens and permanent residents should be able to buy land. Part of the overall uh, 2020 Homes for All plan that the Greens have. The headline, affordable quality housing is a right, I thought fitted so well with uh, a debate to talk about it. And um, I guess with that, what I'd like to give you guys a chance to do is maybe introduce yourself in a couple of minutes so people know who you are, what you're about, and then we will just jump into the debate. So um, Julianne, you first. Just tell us a little bit about who you are and why you're here. Kia ora koutou. My name is Julianne. I'm a member of parliament for the Green Party. Uh, I wasn't born in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I grew up in the United States, but I left there over 18 years ago and I made Aotearoa my home. I did not expect to be a politician here, but um, I've always been really passionate and interested in political issues, uh, particularly around equity, justice and the environment. And I ended up helping out the Greens and standing for Parliament in 2011 to help increase the Green Party vote. And I don't think it was me directly that did it, but our vote did increase by quite a lot that <laughs> that year and I was elected. And so I've had this enormous privilege of working both as a member of Parliament and last term as a minister, minister for women and associate minister of transport and health. And I'm particularly interested in urban development because I see that as a way that we can address a lot of our environmental and social challenges simply by doing things better. Very good. Julianne, thank you for joining us. As, as you say, I noticed you're the current spokesman for building and destruction and urban development, which obviously are, I would assume, a cornerstone of affordable quality housing, two of the parts. And finance. Are... You'd be surprised. Finance. finance has a lot to do with housing at the moment. <laughs> I want to have you back on the podcast at some stage because you've got a fascinating story, which is not what we're getting into it now. Um, but uh, but it will be interesting to hear your full story at some stage as well. But thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Darcy, why don't you tell us uh, who you are and why you're here and what you're about? Awesome. Thanks, Pat. And thanks for having me on this. It's pretty cool. Um, now, I'm a financial advisor with almost 20 years of experience helping New Zealanders from all over the country make the best money moves they possibly can. Uh, personally, I'm married... I am a father of three. I'm from Canada originally, just up the road from Julianne, uh, but I've lived in New Zealand on and off since the mid 80s. And in my spare time, my hobbies include learning about all things money as I wait patiently to develop other hobbies. And I also host a podcast and YouTube channel called the NZ Everyday Investor, also where anyone can learn about things ranging from investing in property, Kiwi savers, shares, crypto, stuff like that. Um, 
I believe I have values in certain areas, you know, like I, I love electric cars. I love the environment. I don't burn, burn plastic, but I'm not an environmentalist. I, um, I believe in giving to the poor, but I'm not a socialist. I encourage financial independence, but I don't promote frugality and I don't necessarily condone greed. But uh, my wife and I own our own home. We have three rental properties for full disclosure, and uh, we provide that to other people who can't afford to own properties themselves. So politically, I have a socialist core and a capitalist operating system and a slight bias towards libertarianism. So put simply, I'd probably vote for David Seymour if he was a better dancer. And that's my background. <laughs> Okay, so um, what we're doing, actually, I should probably bring up for people who are joining us, sort of the format of what we are uh, doing tonight. So this is the format that we put to you guys as to how we're going to run this. It seems quite structured, but I think what that does is gives us the opportunity to, um, to, to kind of get through it, to stay focused, to stay on what we're looking at. Uh, and, and this is what we're going. So uh, the next part of the conversation is going to be you guys having a, a up to 10 minute window to share your views and your thoughts on affordable quality housing as a right. You'll then have a chance also to respond to the other person. Uh, and in that response, which is number four on that screen, if people can see it, that we're calling the rebuttal. Again, it'll be an, an uninterrupted chance for you to respond to what the other person has said. After that, uh, there is a moderated conversation. I will be the moderator. I will be uh, conversing with you guys, asking you guys questions. That will also probably be a point where you guys can talk to each other if you have any questions uh, about what you've been saying, what you've been said. Um, if you are watching, if you do join in, feel free to fire us a chat or a super chat. Uh, we are happy to uh, throw some questions in at number six from the audience. Uh, no guarantees your question will be asked. And of course, if there are any kind of inappropriate or uh, untoward questions, you'll probably be banned, but they certainly won't be getting asked in the, any uh, shape or form whatsoever. Uh, give you guys a chance to wrap up for a couple of minutes and then uh, we'll be off to bed. So we should all be done within, you know, what do you think, guys? Six to 12 hours is probably enough time to, ch to chat about this in general. Um, so what we'll do to start off with is I think the correct way to start is to give you guys a chance to decide who goes first. So um, uh, Julianne, you went first with your introductions. So how about Darcy, you picked heads or tails? Sweet. Let's go for tails. Tails never fails, don't they say that? It is head. So Julianne, you have the choice, uh, the choice to take your 10 minutes uh, first or to do your 10 minutes second. What would you like to do? I'll go second. You'll go second. Okay. So what I'm actually going to do, uh, I'm going to mute Julianne's uh, mic. And in a second, I will mute my mic. And then Darcy, I'm going to keep a 10 minute record for you. Uh, let me set my phone up. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll mute my mic, but I'll come back in when there is 60 seconds to go, just to give you a heads up in case you've kind of lost track of where you are and what you're doing. Yeah, so the mood is affordable quality housing is a right. Darcy Ungaro from the NZ Everyday Investor Podcast, financial advisor, your 10 minutes starts now. Thank you very much, Pat. So affordable, uh, uh, by the way, I'm going to preface this by saying I'm going to speak fast just in the interest of time. So hopefully you guys can catch up, but affordable quality housing is the right thing to aim for. And I agree that we all have a problem to solve. Is it a new problem? No. Is it a growing problem? Well, it definitely hasn't gotten any smaller, right? So it's something that needs to be dealt to. Um, now, I don't think there would be anyone watching tonight that would feel that affordable quality housing isn't something that we need more of, but I suggest most would say it's essential. And many would say that they're trying to improve their own situation. Some would say perhaps they're actually struggling for any housing at all. But what I think about in this space isn't whether or not we have a problem with housing, it's how we're going to solve it. The government is capable of using any platform they want to obtain and maintain power. And I think it's great that they're trying to solve the problem here. I question their motives, their competency and their track record. I didn't grow up in wealth personally. And in fact, for the most part, we lived in rental properties ourselves growing up. So relative to some, maybe we were poor, but later on, I really got to know poverty. And so for background, a few years, I volunteered feeding Auckland's homeless. Uh, I visited the slums in Bangladesh. I've seen them in South Africa and the favelas of Brazil as well. And what I've seen is no matter the jurisdiction, inaccessibility to housing is everywhere. And access to affordable and quality housing results in everyone being able to solve bigger problems like their health, all that sort of stuff. It, it can all improve their relationships. And over time, they become more resilient. But is it a right? 
So I'm tasked with the job of trying to convince you that it isn't, so I'll do my best. And I believe that building wealth extends far beyond our own homes and into the homes of others. I believe that we all have a role to play in helping the poor with time or money. And if you're incentivized to work hard and smart, you'll also pay proportionally more in tax so others can access housing via government agencies. So in fact, rising inequality requires more Kiwis than ever before to succeed financially because the government's going to need more revenue, unless, of course, they print it. So the question I have around this is this. Before we rely more on the state, what can we as individuals do first? Now, over the past couple of decades, we've seen power shift further and further away from the community to the other two pillars of society, government and corporations. Now, more people with their limited agency to do good, instead of, instead of doing it themselves, they rely on a government to fix things that we could potentially fix ourselves. So we all need to play a part to ensure housing is quality and affordable, but I'd suggest it shouldn't necessarily be considered a right. What it should be considered, though, I think, is three things. So firstly, it's an important thing to pursue. It's a responsibility that every adult should take ownership of. And thirdly, it's a valid way for everyday Kiwis to build wealth and provide a social good. So I'll break it down one by one. Firstly, it's an important, it's an important thing to pursue. So it's important not only to be able to access a home to reside in, but the freedom to pursue ownership is important also, not just of your own home, but multiple properties for the purposes of investment if you choose to. Now, all homes should have people in them, but some people can and should own multiple homes. To get into position to own a home or own a rental property or two, you need to meet certain criteria. You need to earn money. Now, here, if you desire a nicer home, you need to earn even more money. And in the pursuit of more income, chances are you're providing more value to the community, managing finance as well, saving, maintaining good relationship. All of this good stuff doesn't have bad consequences. It generally has positive spillovers. Now, not everyone is able to achieve home ownership, but alignment towards a goal like this in and of itself, I think, actually assists with creating financial independence. So although to some it may appear that mom and dad investors are merely fueled by greed and they're the enemy, I'd suggest they're efficiently supplying and maintaining affordable and quality housing for others that can't afford it themselves. One of the most easiest and common sense ways, I think, to enable access to affordable quality housing is to incentivize the pursuit of ownership. Less dependency on the state for housing means more tax revenue that can be deployed in health and education. So in addition to being something where you should be pursuing, access to housing is a responsibility that every adult should take ownership of. And in a free market, some do get left behind, some race off far ahead, but the bulk of us probably sit somewhere in between the spectrum. Sorry about that, hitting the mic. So if we want to solve a problem, the first step is actually to take ownership of it, right? But who owns this problem of housing? Is it owned by the state or should we the people actually own it? Now, I don't know if you've seen that clip on YouTube. I'm sure you probably have, uh, Pat, but there's this video of Yanni versus Laurel. It's that one word sounds different to completely different people, right? So I find that fascinating. Half the people that hear that word think it's Laurel. The other half think it's Yanni. And when it comes to solutions, some of us will go one of two ways. We'll look to the state or we might look to how we can solve the problem ourselves. So I'd like to suggest that there's a possibility that politicians have been using the plot, the platform of housing affordability to obtain and maintain power. In fact, prior to this present health crisis that we're in, I think it's a curious, a curious thing that the phrase housing crisis was very much absent from our vernacular. It's a simple technique, fan into flame, some sparks of envy, create the haves and the have nots, mix it all up a bit and then promise a solution. You can create a state of dependency revolving around the solution that you promised, job done. So the big question I have for politicians is this, does the solution to housing inaccessibility and uh, affordability, does that sit with wealth distribution or sorry, wealth redistribution? Rather than encourage individual responsibility, I think the state is actually encouraging dependency with this strategy. All the while, envy is masquerading as social justice. So. We in the community need to feel the weight of this problem and be incentivized to offer up solutions. So to access affordable quality housing, it's an important thing to pursue. It's a problem we should all take ownership of. And thirdly, it's a valid way for Kiwis to build wealth while providing a social good. 
social responsible investing. How can I succeed in growing wealth while making a positive impact? That's the big problem many everyday investors are trying to solve. So a house used to be something pretty simple, right? It was a place to live in, raise a family in, but gradually this morphed into an asset. It became financialized. It was a tool or it's starting to become a tool that we could use to build wealth. And that's kind of, it's changed, right? It's not necessarily as innocent as what it used to be. Now, many people heading towards what's otherwise going to be a pretty average retirement now have a chance to reduce their dependency on the state for housing and medical care later on because the fruits of property investment have enabled it. In addition, they now have a chance at being able to help their kids obtain something they believe may be impossible to do in the future by their own home. Now, many quote statistics saying that the proportion of home ownership has been declining over the past 30 years, but they ignore the fact that it was actually increasing for the 60 years prior to that. Nothing stays the same over time, right? Whether it's interest rates, sea levels, the North Pole, or the proportion of households that own their own home. Somehow, though, we're being led to believe that Kiwis buying rental properties is why the rates of home ownership have declined. Now, it definitely plays a part here. Don't get me wrong. I've seen many of an auction room um, where you can feel the frustration in the room of buyers missing out on their own home to someone who already has a home and they're just racking and stacking them for uh, capital gains. But if we're talking about providing affordable and quality housing, every property actually needs an owner, right? And I personally believe that the best landlords are people, not organizations of any sort. Now, most would agree, including myself, that the real solution probably lies in creating more housing stock. If there is another enemy, however, it's not mom and dad property investors. If anything, it's private equity, it's pension funds, and it's potentially Airbnb. But they're sitting in the third row of the family SUV. The driver or the government can only reach to those in the middle seat, the middle class, those trying to become financially independent. They're the ones that they can reach. So in summary, access to housing is important, but it's not a right. It's, very, it's a very, very important thing to pursue. It's a responsibility that every adult has to obtain for themselves and for their tribe. It's a valid way for everyday Kiwis to build wealth and provide a social good, but it's not a right. Being mm -hmm. a right, yep, being right implies that it's someone else's job to give it to you. However, when the community owns its own problems, I think great outcomes can occur. So that's it for me. Thanks for your time and patience. And I look uh, forward to hearing what Julianne has to say. Well, there you go. Darcy, thank you very much for uh, for sharing. I can see people are already uh, chatting away in the chat. I thought maybe between these, because what will happen if we leave all the questions and comments to the very end, guys, is there could be like hundreds of them. We will never get through them. Um, so just very quickly before we go to Julianne, a comment here that says, the only way housing can be affordable is if the government owns it. You can't be pro-capitalism. Then tell a landowner he, has, he or she has to keep the rent at a low rate forever. Um, and what about, uh, here's another one here as well from Na uh, Nathaniel. Uh, housing is not an investment. The property is Kiwi Fano are saving up, making risky bets, leveraging themselves to the hilt. What happens if the market crashes? Hmm, says Nathaniel. Uh, if you are watching us online at the moment, feel free to um, send a chat or a super chat through or some kind of comment. And uh, if it's a chance that we can fit it in, we will fit it in. So uh, as I mute Darcy, for a 10 minute section. Julianne, are you uh, good to go? Yes. All right, let me set up my timer, boom, for 10 minutes. And uh, the Honorable Julianne Ginger from the New Zealand Green Party, uh, your 10 minutes starts now. I think of a right as something that we've decided collectively as a society, something that we think is really important for all humans to have access to. and. The ideas about rights have evolved over hundreds of years, um, but I think we've gotten to the point in society where we think it's really important that every person gets a chance at having the basics to live a dignified life. And the reason for that is because we actually all do better when everybody has that. Um, all of us are born onto this planet. Um, some of us at the moment are born into families that own more. But really, uh, that is just a legacy of decisions that, you know, of things that happened before, some of which we would probably say now were not very just. You know, 100, 200 years ago, um, it was okay to own other people um, and to force them to work for, you know, free. Um, and now we don't think that's okay anymore. So 
when we talk about rights, it's something that's evolving and it's something that when, when I speak of it, I think many people in New Zealand would agree with, which is that every person should have access to the basics. That's what we need for equality of opportunity in our society. And the basics include an affordable, decent home that doesn't make you sick. And not everybody has access to that right now. And that's a result of decisions, um, not of a free market. There's no such thing as a free market. Um, but it's a result of a system that's been created by government policy over time. And so when we talk about making the system fair, um, I heard Darcy mention uh, you know, that people blame individuals for making decisions that will, you know, be good investments for them, like blaming mom and dad, property investor, landlords. Um, I certainly don't blame them. I don't think they're motivated. They're operating in a perfectly logical way in a system that is unfair and unjust and that is leading to outcomes that isn't good for New Zealand as a whole. And so the argument that we've made in the Greens is we need to change the system we change the system by changing the incentives um, and ensuring that everyone is paying their fair share of tax. And tax is something that's really important because um, that's how we fund all of these things that we all benefit from uh, public infrastructure, public health, you know, our health services. And the more that we can kind of collectively fund like that, um, kind of the more efficient and better outcomes we get. Now, I'd probably agree with Darcy that um, an overly centralized government isn't going to be as good at delivering those services. Um, and that's why the Greens often argue for more devolution, more local democracy. Um, really important that we have good governance over how our public money is being spent. But it is really important that it is public because nobody can, you know, we can't claim that there's equality of opportunity in a world where kids who are born to poor parents or parents who are struggling don't have the same access to health and education as kids who are born to rich rich parents. And so ultimately this what we're trying to achieve through housing policy is an equal equal playing field. And we also know through history and I mean and you can look at this um not just in New Zealand, but it was definitely true in New Zealand. Um, we had a government uh, that was very focused on building state houses, and that achieved really good value for money in terms of the houses that were built. Um, and it really improved the situation of the people who were living in it and who could access that. Up until I think it was the 80s or the 90s, there were quite a few policies that enabled people to... Um, capitalize their family benefit uh, to put down towards the first home. Um, there were, you know, lots of policies that supported people to get into home ownership. And that's what enabled relatively high rates of home ownership. Um, but as that started to decline, and we have other government policies that are leading to increases in property values, for example, that exacerbates inequality and it exacerbates um, the lack of a fair go that people get. So like right now, uh, in the last year, because the Reserve Bank engaged in quantitative easing, which, you know, I can understand the reasons for that. Um, it's just increased the amount of money that banks are lending against residential property. And because the supply of residential property isn't increasing as fast, uh, people are just people who already have equity, who already own property, are able to borrow more, to buy more, and they can bid up more the price. And uh, that's that's while I can understand from a personal financial investment point of view that might be making you wealthy, that's not making us as a society wealthier. Like that's silly. Us borrowing money and bidding each other up on the price of housing isn't actually making us better off as a society. What would make us better off is if all of our citizens had access to affordable quality housing that didn't make them sick, because they'd be much less likely to end up in hospital and emergency rooms. Um, and so they'd be putting less pressure on the health system. Um, they'd have more time to be productive and you know pursue the things that they're really passionate about if they weren't worried about making ends meet and they had quality accessible housing. 
So all of these things are interconnected and we can't take a like personal view of what's good for me and assume that that's going to work if we make it possible for everyone. Every person cannot become a property investor and get rich off profit, property investment. That's not possible. And us as a country, we are not better off economically for pursuing that type of investment. So I don't think it's a good thing for the government to be encouraging people to invest money in residential property. Um, I actually think that if we had local governments, um, NGOs and others providing quality rentals, we could, they could provide it much better rentals and they could do so, you know, not for profit, but in a way that covered their financial costs. And we certainly have evidence from overseas that, that those sorts of policies work much better. I mean, if you look in countries like um, in Scandinavia and Denmark, it's absolutely normal for local and central government to be involved in providing affordable housing. And, you know, and the market will never provide for the people who are at the bottom of the heap, you know, it, it just never will. So private property developers will go out and they'll mainly aim for the high end of the market. They might aim for the middle end, but ultimately we need there to be provision of social housing. And we can do that in a much better way if we do it in a coordinated way. Um, so this is really just about changing the system to get outcomes that are better for the environment and better for people. And ultimately, having people living in poverty, having people be homeless, it costs us more as a society. It's not the right thing to do. None of us would want to be in that situation, I'm sure. Um, and we need to understand that the situation that people are in is not always a direct result of poor choices they've made or good choices they've made. The system is stacked in favor of people who uh, have the right color skin, have the right education, uh, have the right look, <laughs> and who were born potentially into a family with money. I mean, not always. But there's no question that in Aotearoa, New Zealand, if you're Māori or you're Pacifica, you're much less likely to own a home. You're much less likely to be treated fairly in the workplace. Um, and that starts to compound on itself um, generations of trauma post-colonization and land theft um, have resulted in a situation where we have a lot of people living in really difficult circumstances. And it makes sense for us to pool our resources um, through central or local government in order to solve this problem, because we're all going to be better off. One minute, but it sounds like you're wrapping up there. Yeah, oh. I think I covered it. You covered it? You're all good? Well, there you yeah. go. I can stop my little timer then, can't I? Um, thanks, guys. Really interesting. Really interesting stuff. Um, I'll cancel that. I'll cancel that. And um, you've both made your opening statements. Now, the next part of the conversation is giving you a chance to um, respond to one another and what you have said uh what we'll do again is we'll give you up to five minutes if you don't have five minutes that's fine it's up to five minutes uh, i will give you uh, and i'm sure on your end you can see that it goes to full screen of you uh what i'll do is after four minutes i'll bring it back to this three shot so you know if it comes back to this three shot you've got about 60 seconds to go just so i don't have to talk uh back into your ear and distract you if you're in the middle of some flow that's going to change the world we don't want to do that um so yeah so this is a chance for you and i, and I think I, I think i was watching you both uh kind of um oh gosh my, i don't want to hang up on someone um i i think that i saw you both jotting down notes and writing notes away sort of thing so what what, what we'll do uh darcy is we'll come to you as i set my timer for five minutes as i said you'll be on the screen by yourself uh when uh the three of us come back into the room that means that you've got 60 seconds to go that's a pretty easy way to do it i think Okay. All right, so sir, uh, your five minutes starts now. Cool. Thank you. So I don't, I don't really have much to say, to be honest, in terms of a rebuttal, because to a certain extent, I, I largely agree with a lot of what Julianne says in terms of the motivation, you know, what the desire is to help people, especially those that have been marginalized and left behind, the, you know, the, the people that the free market have, has, has left behind. Um, I think the only thing probably where where I would sort of take issue with is is the fact that the, there's this underlying assumption that by allowing others to succeed, it's actually impossible for there to be po positive spillover effects or the implication that if those people do well, then by default, they're taking away a finite resource from others. 
when in reality, yes, housing stock is limited. And ultimately, that is the problem that we need to solve. If there are more people that are competing for that, it's going to bid up prices and people get even more marginalized. But we're zooming in on something. Whereas if we if you zoom out, if the free market was left to its own devices, and I'm not suggesting that we deregulate everything here, it would be absolute carnage, right? But it would actually find equilibrium. I think sometimes the biggest harm happens when regulators interfere with the free market because it actually builds up pressure, it distorts things, and it creates a need for regulation to, to fix the problems of regulation. Take loan to valuation uh, ratio restrictions as an example. So with the Reserve Bank, you know, in an attempt to you know, create more financial stability within the financial system in New Zealand, they introduced higher deposit requirements for property investors and home buyers. So if you're a home buyer, you now need 20% deposit. It's very difficult to get a mortgage with less than 20% deposit. We were fortunate when we bought our first home that we were able to get a 5% deposit approved, right? So we, we were able to get into the housing market. Otherwise, I'd be in the exact same position today that many other people are. Regulation doesn't necessarily create better outcomes. It doesn't make things more equitable but it can cause greater distortions. So yeah, it's true, like around the Reserve Bank, especially in the last 18 months, keeping interest rates relatively low. I don't really know what other options they had. It really supercharged though, that, that inequality that existed. However, the big story that we all forget is that inflation, which we haven't really seen yet, will probably be offsetting most of those gains given enough time. However, it still doesn't help those people that are struggling to own their own home. Um, now, the other thing is, is that, you know, when when I first moved to New Zealand in 1985, we lived in a property with no insulation. It was a brand new home, no insulation, no ventilation, um, single pane windows, you know, no double glazing. It was freezing. It made me wish I went back to, to Canada living in negative 20 degree winters. Um, since then, you, know, you wouldn't get away with that these days as a rental home. I actually think we don't give enough credit to you know, the stuff that's actually already happened to improve the quality of our housing stock, but that is expensive and it causes higher rents, which no doubt makes it harder for a lot of people to access quality and affordable housing. Do taxes help? I kind of doubt it. As a landlord myself, you know, we haven't really passed on the increases that we're going to face, not yet anyway, with tax increases, but inevitably some of that will. So yet another example, I guess, of how more and more regulation or more tax isn't necessarily the solution. So totally agree with the motivation. I totally agree with the outcomes that we're trying to achieve here by making sure we all have an equal opportunity to get into quality and affordable housing. However, the methodology, I think, I, I'm just not entirely convinced that increasing taxation is the way that we're gonna solve this. Look at that, 45 seconds. I have to say, so far, you guys have been very impressive on your timings. Normally, when you get these kinds of things going on, people go over and over and over and over and over again. Um, excellent. Uh, I'm just going to throw another comment out there because we'll put a few of these up. Uh, if people are joining us and they're watching, remember, you can uh, share a comment. We'll, we'll save any kind of questions till later on, but some a few comments are coming in. Uh, I think it's Kim. Kim says, the only real winners of a million-dollar housing market are the Australian banks. Um, so thanks for that comment. Uh, Kim, you are welcome to share your comments on whatever social media you're watching us on. Right now we're on Facebook, uh, two Facebook pages. We're on uh, YouTube, we're on Twitch, we're on Twitter. My dog's just coming to see me. Thank you. Come here. It's all right. Um, so what we'll do now, Julianne, is we'll do exactly the same thing for you. You have a five-minute chance to respond to what Darcy has said. And... Uh, at the end of four minutes, I'll bring us back up to three windows, so you'll know 60 seconds-ish to go. And then we'll have a, a bit of a chin wag, the three of us. So let me say uh, to you, Julianne Genta, that your five minutes starts now. I'll start by saying um, that affordable housing isn't the only outcome we need, right? Um, and it's really important that we talk about affordable housing in the context of affordable transport, because some of the proposals to just open up land supply and provide more houses on the fringe in order to have cheap housing will actually not achieve the goal of improving equity for people because the further away you are from goods and services, jobs, education, the more cars you need to own, the more infrastructure costs there is for the local government, 
Um, so you can sort of achieve a cheaper house situation, but a more expensive transport situation, which means the ultimate income, um, the ultimate impact on household income is the same. Um, and that's why I think housing is quite different than things like iPhones or water bottles. You know, you can, it's actually um, in a unique place and, and we don't have an unlimited supply of land and we need to use our land well because we're using it for lots of different things. We're using it to grow food. Um, we're using it for transport infrastructure, not very well at the moment. Um, and so that's where I think coordination is really necessary in order to provide quality housing in quality location with access to schools, parks, infrastructure. Um, you know, you have to have the water infrastructure. And so, so it really works much better if it's provided in a coordinated way, um, not just by landowners looking to hawk off houses and then lobby government to spend billions of dollars on a motorway so you can get there. Um, and I guess I take my example, so the empirical example of what will work from places like Austria, Vienna, um, some parts of Germany um, and Denmark have done well, Sweden's done well in some respects, um, Switzerland. So there's, there's places where um, it's been demonstrated that you can provide infrastructure like housing and transport in a much more efficient way if you do it in a coordinated way. And that coordination is usually done through democracy. It's done through local government or central government or a partnership between the two. Um, the reason tax is important in a New Zealand context is because capital gains have not been taxed really up until now. And that leads to a really perverse situation where people can make more untaxed money off of investment in property than they can through work. And that's not really something we want to encourage. Um, I think tax is a way of uh, leveling the playing field, making it, you know, so if you think uh, Central Reserve Bank put a quantitative easing, all the house prices have gone up. It makes sense for some of that to come back to public infrastructure and public purpose, public services. And that's the reason to, to for taxes, because otherwise you've got a situation where people have kind of had a windfall gain, individuals that's privatized as a direct result of government policy. Um, and it makes sense for at least some of that uh, to come back to central government or local government who can then use it to invest in infrastructure that benefits the public. That means more houses can be built. I agree with the point on the LVRs. That wasn't a good policy. Um, I think that they should have limited the LVR increases to investors. Uh, that would have that would have helped quite a bit. Um, I realize the the problem the Reserve Bank is struggling with is that they are um, like they can't do it all themselves through monetary policy um, or their their toolkit to try and influence things. Really, central government needs to be leading, and I think that if central government had had a capital gains tax, um, had had greater um, regulations with respect to rentals, um, then we wouldn't have seen the crazy sort of rush to property and we would have seen a more balanced um, type of investment that would have had a better outcome. But do I still have time? Because I could keep going. Yep. You, you, you have another 30 seconds if you want it, you can have it. Um, I just I just want to talk about, but there's a lot of evidence about a housing first policy as well, which is you can't deal with the problem of homelessness. It's cheaper to just build houses and provide them socially um, to the homeless than it is to try and address the other um, problems and complexities that come along with homelessness. Ba basically, people can't deal with their mental health issues or their substance abuse issues if they don't have a place to call home. And I think Utah demonstrated that if you just build homes and give people homes, it actually costs a lot less than homelessness. Thanks very much. My alarm is about to go off. Look at that, six seconds. Well, look, let's just roll straight into this. is the part of the um, part of the evening the debate where we have kind of a three-way conversation. So let's just pick up on that point that Julianne's uh, just talked about. I remember writing a blog piece maybe, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago, talking about most of us in New Zealand, uh, the way we build wealth is through housing. Um, so what is the way that we enable those who currently can't get into the housing market to build wealth? And to be honest with you, from my kind of old man, pessimistic, get off my grass kind of position, it seems that government after government after government comes in and they say things like 10,000 houses, 10,000 houses. And I hear that kind of thing and I go, well, 
I struggle to book a builder myself. Where are they even going to get people from to build these 10,000 houses? It feels like a bit of a pipe dream to me. It feels like a political football where we're bouncing around this idea. Both sides do it. You know, I'm not just saying it's the Labor, current Labor government. National did it as well when they were in power. And it feels to me, um, perhaps being a bit of a pessimist, and I apologize for that, who, who are optimists out there, that that's a solution that's very difficult to solve. But it feels like maybe, and it's starting to happen, uh, issues around rental properties is an easier issue to solve potentially places like France and Germany, they have kind of not a culture of owning their own houses, but they have a culture of being renters their life, but there are things in place where the renters, basically it's their home. They don't get to get, they get kicked out. You know, the, the, the landlord doesn't phone the person in Dunedin and say, Oh, look, my, my son's coming to, um, you know, university next year. So you're, you've got your 90 days or whatever the official time rate is. Julianne question to you directly. And I'd be happy to get your take on this as well, Darcy. Would it be better for us to be actually fixing the rental market issues, making that a better, safer place than attempting, to me, what seems an insurmountable issue around home ownership? Yeah, I absolutely. And we've run a campaign around that. Um, it's really important. Like we, I think we're calling for uh, rent controls in the short term, at least, while we work to increase supply. Um we did stop rent increases during COVID last year, but um, there's no reason why we shouldn't just continue that because the there's no reason structurally, unless a landlord can prove that they have reasons for increasing their costs, why should they be able to just increase costs for rent? I mean, while there's a shortage of supply, if, we, if central government and others are providing a lot of housing supply, um, rent controls can be a really good short-term stopgap to stop rents from rising at a at a un, really unaffordable rate. The other thing that we've called for is a rental war and a fitness. Um, Darcy, I don't doubt that the quality of housing has increased slightly, but it's still really bad compared to um, most other parts of the world. Some of that is due to you know our building code is is really out of date, um, and I think. I, again, this is an area where I think um, we're a small country, and if government was really focused on investing and in building the capacity around uh, quality home building, which I think they are, it's just going to take some time to get that up to speed, um, then we're going to get much better outcomes from our housing stock. Uh, so, for example, in Europe, you know, you'll see um, the public sector is very involved in some countries in the delivery of, of housing. And they have uh, much more prefabrication, even prefab apartments. I've seen a video of an eight-story passive house standard apartment building put up in 18 hours. Um, you know, obviously, they have to do the inter internal fi finishing as well. But, I mean, that's like the opposite of our, of our building and construction sector. So, yeah. So, I think government involvement, protecting renters and making it more like a choice for life. And But that also kind of means having more institutional landlords rather than just random New Zealanders who are buying two or three properties uh, for the capital gains. They're not going to uh, be the best landlords usually, or you're not going to get consistency. It's going to be harder um, to ensure a good outcome for everyone with that sort of ad hoc approach that we have at the moment. Just before you jump in on this, Darcy, just I, I don't know the numbers, Julianne, you will. When I used to work on ZB, there was always conversations around how many empty um, you know, housing New Zealand homes there actually were around the country, and it was thousands of empty ones waiting. Is that still because I wrote down you wrote short supply? Is that the case still now, or are our housing New Zealand uh, homes jam packed and we've got no room for anyone else? Well, there's a waiting list. I mean, and the waiting list is getting longer and longer for housing New Zealand homes, and that's because there was a huge gap for a couple of decades. We basically didn't increase the supply, and that's ended up being correlated with, um, and there might be some in some parts of the country that aren't being used, but I mean, really you do have to give people homes in a place where they can work and have jobs and 
you know, so it could be that there's some in places where yeah, right. it simply doesn't so work. In one part of the country, there might be a whole bunch available, but there's not the people for them. In another part of the country, it might be overflow. Darcy, do you want to jump in on the mm. renting for life conversation versus? Yeah. Uh, I'm, also, I'm also interested actually to jump back mm. at some stage, Julianne. You talked about, was did you use institutionalized landlords? You used the term that you were talking about. It almost like sounded like saying, we need some good landlords, not those, not those nasty investor ones. I know you weren't saying that as my paraphrase, but there was a phrase in there that maybe institutional? Like institutional. big like kind of big institutional landlords is what are more common in Europe. Uh not no not necess not necessarily government, but um BlackRock. But like big organizations. Like social groups, groups about social justice. Yeah, and it could be not yeah, for okay. profit. It could be for profit. Um okay. I mean that that's what exists overseas in places where they have much higher rates of renting. Darcy? Yeah. So my, my only concern around the institutional piece, just to start with while we're on that, is that, you know, what we've seen overseas, especially, is that with the financialization of housing, as soon as you do introduce institutions like that, like, you know, BlackRock in particular is, is a pretty good example where they're just growing and growing and growing and gobbling up a lot of housing stock. Um, I can see why they would be useful because the, you now have a player that you can coordinate and you can get them to do stuff a certain way. I'm not entirely convinced that would be the best type of landlord myself. I think um, ideally it would be private individuals or government for you know social social housing. I don't know. Like I I I, I like everything that you're saying, Julian. Like the only thing I just keep on thinking about in my head is that you know New Zealand is a small country, big government. I just don't know if we can handle more government involvement or justify it. I understand, you know, we've got a long way to go. New Zealand's like that in a lot of areas, like, you know, go out to, to, to a meal in a restaurant and you'll realize, you know, we've still got a long way to go in the service area, right? Like there, there's a lot that we can improve on. But I think, you know, being a small country, we do kind of have to accept that things are going to be not quite perfect. We should be aiming towards perfection. But I think the more that the government sort of is on the field playing and the less that they're actually just playing the role as a referee, the players eventually are going to get disillusioned. And we kind of need people to be incentivized. Individuals, I think, need to be incentivized to voluntarily contribute their capital rather than actually be a sitting duck and effectively be raped and pillaged of their, their capital in the form of taxation to, to level a playing field. Um, like, I, I get it. But I just I just don't know if New Zealand is is ready for that next level. Um, I'd love to see those outcomes again. I just I'm just not convinced. Yeah, I I wonder, Darcy. Um, as soon as we say things like, and this is a general conversation. Sorry to cut in there, Julian. You can jump in as well. But as soon as we say things like people should be free to invest their money, my question always is, what if they don't? You know, if we're putting the responsibility on these people to mm. be you know, landlords that that invest the money and they provide safe, quality, affordable housing. But then what if they don't? Because it seems like at the moment, maybe I'm wrong. You guys are deeper in the thickets than I am on this, that that it's not especially affordable. The affordable thing, it doesn't seem to be at the moment. So they've got the opportunity to do that now and they're not. Are you kind of talking about an ideology which is unattainable and unreachable, which might sound good in a, in a conversational how it could be, it's like, you know, you always hear about how, I'm not saying you're saying this, but the libertarian idea of, you know, uh, government's putting too many restrictions on the, just let us get on with our work. Whereas sometimes government re regulations on things like how you wire a house are very important, you know, because if you don't, the people cut corners and then houses burn down and people die. You're not saying that. I'm, I'm not saying that. But I guess what I'm saying is what I hear from you, and I'm wondering, maybe Julianne, you could speak to this, or Darcy, if you want to give us 30 seconds to respond, is, is your ideal a little bit unattainable and unrealistic it is an ideal and it is a plan but when boots hit the ground you're basically asking everyone to be uh generous compassionate uh willing to give to the to those less and that doesn't feel like unfortunately the society we live in because mm, they could do that right. now yeah well, and it's, and just I... a, it's just as idealistic as the opposite isn't it so yeah totally acknowledge that that's true that's the extreme um, I guess to counter the other extreme, right? But you're you're right. The the reality, the sweet spot is somewhere in between, right? Yeah. Sorry, Julian, you go. I was just gonna say it's not everyone who's bad, but it, I guess when you have a lack of regulation, then what happens is the twenty percent, like kind of worst, end up dragging the whole thing down with them because um, you know whether that's 
with respect to environmental pollution or whatever. Lots of people want to do the right thing and will be good landlords, but it's sort of the regulation's not there for them. It's there for the ones who won't. And there'll always be some who won't. Um, and also that a lot of people have been encouraged to kind of uh, think more about, I guess, to privilege their own personal financial position over altruism to others. So it wouldn't be surprising if they continue to do that. And so I, I, I don't doubt that there's lots of people out there who want to be really good landlords. And um, I don't know about BlackRock, but I was sort of thinking about the, the large institutional landlords in Europe who are just, you know, they're not out there to make massive profits, but they're just sort of steady and they sort of, they they can deal with all the government regulation, you know, like because the Vienna, they've like got the, Vienna the scale. Model in particular, right? Because you, you're referring to the, the model that they use quite successfully in Vienna. Yeah. Where, where effectively it's a not-for-profit who, and it's amazing what, what they've done. Um, and I think, you know, I, I was watching something on that um, a couple of days ago. Like if that, if that could actually be unleashed here, like, and it just, it just goes to show that you, what you're saying is absolutely correct. That is, as long as the rules are clear and there's some coordination, then people can be free to choose or not. Um, and if they don't, there needs to be a safety net. But it, there's that fine um, balancing act, isn't it? But I think the players, whether it's institutions, government or the community, we, we all thrive, right? When the rules are clear, um, it's when they're changing and when the players change, that's when there's a little bit of anxiety because there's a sense that the power imbalance is shifting a little bit. Well, and I think the real difficulty we have is that we're in a situation where a whole lot of people have invested in doing things a particular way. And we might all say, actually, this isn't a good outcome for New Zealand. We want to change it, but we can't change it without those people feeling judged or disadvantaged in some way. But I would say anyone who you know, owns property is already done very well. So and if you're paying tax, it's because you've made money. So you still come out ahead. So the yeah. funny, I guess the funny thing is the way that um, uh, like a wealth tax or a capital gains tax has been, you know, cast as some sort of punishment rather than something to be proud of. You've done really well and you've done so well that you're giving more back to the community, you know, back to your country and you're helping invest in hospitals and all, all that good stuff. Um, I, I think that we should probably, I think that possibly in Europe, they're more um, culturally, they've uh, accepted more, much, much deeper rates of tax um, and much greater levels of regulation. And it's generally worked well, but it's really important that you've got to um, have good uh, democracy. And I don't think we have good enough local democracy. I'd rather see more housing provided at a local level. I don't totally trust Wellington and big uh, government <laughs> ministries to do things well. So that's where I think the Greens probably align more with what Darcy's talking about. It's yeah, like, I don't think like government's <laughs> working well. I don't think planning rules are working well. Planning rules are a huge part of the problem. And I'm an urban planner and I'm telling you, there's a whole bunch of planning rules that have caused massive problems that I would like to change. But to me, that doesn't mean get rid of planning. It's just like, make it better, fix it, make it more um, democratic and responsive and make sure the rules actually support the outcomes we want, uh, which currently a lot of them don't. Hey, well, th this is not going well. You guys aren't supposed to agree. You're supposed to be how it's supposed to be and how these debates work. <laughs> I was just going to say, Julian, and this is more like me just kind of saying, don't we need to acknowledge? Because quite often we hear, and I'm not a property investor. I am lucky enough to own a house. But it's one. You're not, like, you're not lucky, Pat. You're not lucky. You own a house. That's all you need to say. Uh, no, I'm lucky. My my father was in a position to lend me money to get into the marketplace, and if he couldn't have done that, I wouldn't be in a house right now. So I'm I'm privileged and lucky for the upbringing that I had, for the work that my dad put in for forty or fifty years of his life, to be able to lend like me the me. money. <laughs> well, I'm lucky. It's somebody's but hard I, work, man. It's somebody's hard I, work, right? But, but, I, but I'm lucky. I've I've got. There's no reason that I've got any any right to 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 be his child or, you know, the, the pure luck that gave me to be the, the child of someone who had the capacity to lend um, me and my then partner money to buy our first house and that appreciated and let us buy our second house and that appreciated. So I, I am lucky to own a house, right? Now, you might say it's hard work to keep the house. I'll accept that one because, you know, i gotta got to pay the got to pay the mortgage, but there's yeah, yeah. there's no question. I, I remember I was sitting in a house in, uh, in Stotholm Road in Titarangi in West Auckland thinking, holy crap, we own two properties 
How have we done this? And it was all because I was lucky enough to come from a privileged household. I'm not saying where family was wealthy, but my mum and dad, you know, they bought properties and they got um, equity built up in it. And they had, you know, that kind of, um, what do they call it? Wealth that you haven't got. And it's not the folding stuff, but it's in property. Equity. Yeah. Equity, yeah. And, yeah. and so, yeah, there is a huge amount of luck in that. And I think maybe that speaks to Julianne and what we said earlier about, you know, we have no, uh, we do nothing to be put in the position we are as children. Yet the position we put in children, the families we're in, often doesn't necessarily dictate, but certainly contributes towards many of the successes we read in life. So yes, I believe there is a huge amount of luck that I was put in a, you know, a happy, healthy, secure Irish Catholic family, and that that had a mum and a dad, a mum who was able to stay at home and look after us, be there when we came home. They, I, I didn't do anything to earn that. That wasn't hard work on my part. That was pure luck that, you know, that particular egg and that particular met at the right time, and, and that was me. So I think that we always have to acknowledge we always have luck in these elements. You know what I'm saying? Not yeah. always luck, but luck. I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. So look, what I was going to say, though, so let me just say this. I just want to acknowledge something because we often talk about uh, property developers, or sorry, not developers, but and mum and mum, mom and pop investors. Um, sometimes, you know, the capital gains tax is a question, but can, can we at least also acknowledge that they do pay tax? Because if they get an income off that property, they pay tax on it. So it's not like, well, and you're shaking your head. Are you going to say negatively geared? Is that to, no? Is that no I'm just, I'm out? briefly owned to properties because yeah, I was, we were living in an apartment and then we suddenly had to to move and we bought this house and we I just we had a new baby and I was a minister and I couldn't deal with selling the apartment I didn't really want to sell the apartment so I so we rented it out for two years and I gotta tell you the banks were just like like we thought we'd have to sell the apartment to buy the house but the banks were like oh no oh no just take this equity out and keep the apartment and then you know I went to an accountant and I thought I'd owe money on the money that I earned and I didn't. I didn't owe any money. They were like, oh, no, you can deduct all these expenses and the interest and blah, blah, blah. So um, I made money off owning this property and I didn't have to pay tax on it. So I, I don't believe it's true. And the capital gains okay. is the is the issue. Right. It's when you sell um, like maybe you pay some tax on on the income. If you're not dedu if you don't have a mortgage, you're not deducting interest. That's going to change as well. But um, I, I just thought it was insanely easy. And it was like, this is ridiculous. Because I already own property, banks are offering me this stuff. I can just make money by doing nothing. This is not like, I know it sounds good for an individual, but I know not everyone can do that. And so we don't want a system that encourages that because it's not real, it's not real value being created. Mm. Is there harm? Is there like, obviously, I can think of some obvious areas where there is harm. But walk me through why that's bad. And I'm, I'm, I'm asking that question, Julianne, just because I, I want to hear your response. Like I, I know that there's some negative outcomes, but if the rules are set in such a way where a player can realize an advantage by either taking advantage of those rules or just doing what they're allowed to do, um, if they can do so without causing harm to others, why, why can't they do that? Well, it's just, it's not good for like, the country like it's not real value if you're if you're building new properties then you're creating something that's of value but if all you're doing is owning one that already existed and is going to be occupied by someone then it doesn't really make sense that you can get rich off that um and the only reason for that is uh kind of because of the financialization of the housing market which i think is a mistake you know and i've read a really interesting book about this called between debt and the devil and i realize we're probably going over time pat um, by Adair, um, Adair Thomas Thompson. Um, he was a financial regulator in the UK at the time of the GFC. But, um, you know, he kind of points out that over time, banks have been able to loan much more against um, the equity. And that's part of the reason for asset price inflation. Mm. And that's not real value. And I'd say like what's real value is um, – goods and services, uh, building new homes, you know, like th those things are real value. There's things that are of real value that we don't get paid for, like looking after our children, um, looking mm. after elderly people, um, mm. you know, making uh, food for our friends and none of that gets captured in GDP. But mm. so it's just, it's just kind of a mirage and I can understand why it mm. looks attractive from an individual point of view, but mm. it's, it would be foolish to believe that we're all better off as a society if we 
um, encourage that. We want investment in things that actually produce goods and services like or reduce pure, pollution. In a pure sense, but, yeah. Like on a very, very small scale though, like if, if it was going back to the mom and pop uh, investors, Surely, though, there is there is some positive value by a, a mom and dad property investor owning one or two properties, right? They're less reliant on the state for medical treatment in the future because they have more assets. They don't need they don't need uh, state funding for a residential care subsidy because they have way more assets to use up. They could give it to their children so that the children don't take take from from the future world. They, they've actually already given it to them. So there's probably like like at a small level, I'm sure there's some value that gets created in the pursuit of something good. Um, and surely, at the very least, if we're now paying tax, uh, especially bright line tax and non deductibility of interest mortgages, if we're paying more tax in the process, then surely that's good as well, right? Like there's got to be some good, I wouldn't say there's no value at all. No, I feel like I feel like Pat wants us to wrap up. I would like to. Reply, I've no listen. You know? To be honest, it's up. To, to, I've got all the time in the world, guys. You, you, okay. you guys can. You, you, I don't. I don't care if we're in for another hour. You guys would probably care about that. So uh, <laughs> go for it. Go for it, Julian. I mean, I'm, this is interesting, and I think the reason we're having this conversation is these are the conversations that often people have, but we we follow algorithms that tend to reinforce what we already think and believe. So what I hope, apart from anything else, is people might hear this, they might hear another perspective. The perspective. I'm not stupid enough to think we're going to change anyone's mind tonight, but at least if you hear what other people think and what the perhaps other quote-unquote side thinks, it might at least bring clarity as to why, and I personally believe, you're talking about good for society, that's good for all of us moving forward as, for example, one team of five million. That might be a bit idealistic, but if we understand one another better, we operate better. And that's sort of the whole basis of this elephant TV thing that I started 10 years ago and have come back to it now. So you take as long as you want and you answer. I don't, I don't got to be nowhere. I'm sitting in the basement of my house listening to an interesting conversation. Um, you, look, Darcy, I don't want to like attack anyone or say they've done anything bad, but I'm just saying in an objective sense, uh, what would add more value to society is if um, I think that that wealth was more equity, equitably distributed and everybody had enough. So um the mm. issue, I guess, with individuals is that that ends up, and this is this is a problem that um, Thomas Piketty, the French economist, has kind of really canvassed, and I think it's really worth looking at his uh, book, Capital in the 21st Century and um, Capital and Ideology, is that um, if the, uh, you know, if interest rates are higher than the growth rate of the economy and if the um, return on on assets um, is higher which it has been then what happens is you get natural concentration of wealth and so that's just a mathematical formula it's not because people are smart or brilliant or hardworking or anything it's just a mathematical formula and and so it's it's antithetical to the thing that I know you support which is equity and equality of opportunity um, because you know, you, you end up in like a gilded era where you've, mm. we have a different mechanism yeah. for allocating it. It's not the divine right of Kings. It's now the divine right of the market, yeah, <laughs> but it's right. still the same phenomenon, which is. Neo-feudalism. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, it is. Yeah. It's feudalism. So isn't yeah. this though, for me now jumping to what something Darcy said a wee while ago about his, his idea was an ideology in an extreme that might be unattainable. Isn't what you're saying also, isn't this the counter opposite because there's a lot of research out there that says if we spread the wealth more equi equitably uh, however that works you know after a certain amount of time the top 10 percent will still own the, the the sum total of it again it ends up going back to these so so is it realistic to look well, i guess what i'm looking for is, <laughs> is answers you're the experts i'm the i'm the moron here i'm looking for good, a way good to luck listen. pat if you're looking for answers good luck man <laughs> well i mean what pkd has suggested and i and i think this is right is um is probably very idealistic but at some point you know you have to make the case for it and and things do change you know it's like the people who were fighting for abolition of slavery uh, several hundred years before it happened um or I don't know if it was that far, a hundred years before it happened, would have been seen as total dreamers and thought they right. were. And yet it's unthinkable now that, you know, slavery would be okay. So people, you know, humans are evolving and changing our views on things. And um, I think, so his suggestion, he has some suggestions. I mean, what we would probably need is like a global wealth tax and a global UBI. And he even recommended like a universal inheritance where everybody at the age of 25 gets 
$30,000 or something like that. And that you, you use that to not achieve perfect equity. You know, it's not perfectly equal. There is, but it's like the difference between, okay, the poorest person is, um, one has one fifth of the assets and income as the richest person instead of one, one, you know, 10,000th or something, you know, we know we have billionaires, no one can earn a billion dollars. You would have to earn $5,000 a day for 500 years to have a billion dollars. And that really starts to put it in perspective. Actually, this is a, those are crazy numbers. Um, and it doesn't make sense for someone to have that much more than everyone else and for the people at the bottom to be living in such dire circumstances. So I think if we raise up the bottom to like a dignified level, then naturally there will have to be some, you know, some of the, the, the wealthiest people cannot own that much wealth. And why would they, a lot of them don't even want to, I mean, it's just crazy. You can't That's spend right. that much money yeah. as an individual. Like Warren, Warren Buffett and, and what's his name from Microsoft starting to try and give them as much of it as way as they can. And they've still got billions. Yeah. But to do it in a more democratic way, I think it's just to recognize that um, we are part of a community and a society. And, and while we do have, you know, individual differences and preferences um, to kind of assert that we have, I, I don't know. I think it, it's weird to think that one person has that much more say over what, how wealth is spent when really it's been generated in a collective way. And it's just a kind of mathematical fact that it's accumulated to just one person. Mm. Hey, um, let me just say to the people watching right now, there's a bunch of questions that have come in. I want to, I want to ask one, one, one or two more questions of you guys, and then we'll go to people's questions from the audience. If you're watching right now and you want to ask a question, put it in whatever chat you're in. Um, I'm just saying straight away, it doesn't mean we'll get to all of them. Um, if I feel like the questions already been answered previously, we won't necessarily get to it, but feel free to um to ask a question and after this last little wrap we'll do a couple of q a from the audience and then we'll wrap up and go home and i think i can smell my dinner from here i've got one of those hrv ventilation systems speaking of um speaking of healthy homes Green ventilation yeah and the kitchen the kitchen upstairs the smells from the cooking go into the ceiling go into the hrv and then get blown down into my studio so I'm, my, my mouth's watering a little bit at the moment because i can smell dinner that i'm going to have after we've had this darcy i wanted to ask you a question it was a really interesting phrase you used in your opening statement you talked about people sh should own you used the word should and it was multiple homes mm. um, i'm interested why you think people should uh, try and attain multiple homes mm. and also question number two from that how you were talking about because you're kind of both saying, and this is the typical thing with these sorts of conversations, you're both saying something similar, which is the government needs more income. And I guess, Julianne, if I'm unfairly over paraphrasing, you're saying through tax, uh, through tax of various ways, and so are you, Darcy, but you're saying getting it in a different way. When you were talking about getting it your way, Darcy, it sort of sounded to me, and this is an unfair way to say it, like the wealthy people will provide tax to the government that will trickle down to the people at the bottom. And I wonder is if what you're talking about is sort of a form of trickle down economics with the people at the top paying a bunch of tax and then kind of passing it off to the lowly people at the bottom. I'm 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 being facetious on purpose. So yeah, tell me about should own should try to attain multiple parties. Uh, I'm yeah. sorry, properties. And are you basically talking about trickle down economics? I think I might be talking about trickle down economics, and I I, I think that we kind of often discount it as something that never worked. But just like anything, it, it takes time. And I think it probably worked, but maybe not very well. But it, it probably did have some effect. But the um, the whole kind of should owning multiple properties thing, the, re the reason why I kind of go there is that, and yes, it, I'll, I'll acknowledge right away that it's very idealistic. And I, I definitely suggest that it's not even possible, kind of like what you were saying, Julianne, there's just not enough property for everybody to do that. So I'm not saying that that is uh, the strategy that everybody needs to follow. But... I think it is something good for a lot of Kiwis to pursue because in the pursuit of more property ownership, you you have to actually like on the way to it, you have to adopt good disciplines, which I think I really think that that creates positive spillovers, you know, working harder, earning more money, adding more value to your employer, which effectively is always generating more and more tax because you're serving your self-interest in trying to own more property. So that's one part of it, but owning multiple properties where I'm going with that 
is that I still believe that individuals, members of the community, the people in New Zealand actually make better landlords in aggregate versus an institution or a government. Now, not necessarily in the context of social housing necessarily, but for the most part with the existing housing stock, I, I still see a case for actually having people as landlords rather than heavy reliance on the state. Because number one, it means that there's less reliance on the state for those property owners because they have more resource, but also for a tenant to have a problem and be able to rely on legislation which is attached to a real person who has their own personal capital at risk, not just someone who's managing capital on behalf of the state or institution, there's far more direct accountability. And so that kind of skin in the game, I think is, is absolutely critical to achieve, you know, quality, affordable housing. Well, you know, in terms of quality housing, for sure, affordable, I'm not so sure, but quality housing, definitely. Do you have any response to that, Julian? Anything you want to say? Well, I, I like I understand the theory and I totally agree that if you would think that those kind of more personal relationships would lead to better outcomes. But anecdotally, there's certainly a lot of uh, really bad experiences that renters have with um, individual landlords. And I think one thing about an institution is that um, it has the capacity to comply with regulations and to and to kind of like follow the law and ha it has some pretty like if you've got good good regulations and if you've got good enforcement then they, there is a there are really good incentives and they've got more capacity and scale to do things well um but i i kind of think you have to have a regulator in there you know like oh, i don't yeah. think you can get around that um and i think it's really hard for um and my, and my also my experience with friends who've ended up accidentally owning properties that were rented out because you know they met their partner and moved to a new place and they both previously owned a different one um they were getting advice from property management companies like to do the to comply with the regulations at the last possible minute you know you know so it's there's other actors that are probably need to be regulated here in new zealand around the property management space mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um because my, you know, my friend was telling me ethically, no, I don't, I don't want, you know, I don't want my tenants living in a house that's cold. And she's got the property management people saying, oh, well, you don't have to spend that money for another two years. Wow. Um, why would you? And then her partner had a different, you know, her partner ha was very focused on the financial aspect. So I just <laughs> think, um, you know, he didn't see a problem with it. He was like, yeah, why would you spend that money sooner? Um, so I, I, I just think that, Again, I try to focus on the system. How do we make the system deliver better outcomes? Mm -hmm. And I understand the idea of like personal relationships being a good way to um, to mediate that. But I think in the case of residential mm -hmm. property mm -hmm. in New Zealand, that yeah. there's too, ma uh, too many stories. <laughs> yeah, and I, th I think, you, but you touched on something which is really, really quite important. Which I which I think it's it's escape. Like I, I've, I personally don't have any problems with regulation. I think. Regulation rules, as long as they're clear, ideally set in stone and automated and not open to interpretation, um, perfect. But the property management industry, correct me if I'm wrong, if anyone knows any better than this, but I'm pretty sure it's not regulated, right? They have to yeah. comply with, with certain bits of legislation, of course, but it's not regulated. So yeah, it makes absolute sense that you know, like, because me as a financial advisor, I'm regulated with the advice I have to give. There's certain things that I have to abide by when I'm dishing out advice. And for a um, a tenant, there's they're, they, they're subject to rules, but the landlord, they may or may not want to do well. You never know what you're going to get, but you need to have clear rules and a pathway of enforcement, which in a lot of cases is a, is a property management firm. So I think that that's absolutely, you know, it's low hanging fruit right there. Bit like a box of chocolates, Darcy. You never know what you're going to get, eh? Something like that. that. Yeah. Um, my, my, my last question to you, Julianne, and remember if you're watching, feel free to fire a question through. We'll get to a few of them before we head off. Here's my last question. This is what I was trying to wrap my head around, right? The moot and the uh, housing policy headline from the Greens are the same thing. Affordable quality housing is a right. Um, I want to just kind of get a clarity on that because – Sort of like the, I always feel like the devil is in the detail, and and maybe a bit of what Darcy just said with regulation. You know, clarity is really important. Um, the word right is a very important thing, because I guess I ask if something quality but it's not affordable, does that mean someone's rights are being breached? Or if something's affordable but it's not quality, is someone's rights being breached? Is if that was a 
a policy that was passed and that was the wording that was used, how would that then, what would be the metric to figure that out? Because when something becomes a right, I also think about you can have your rights impinged upon, which can then have a punitive response to the person breaching your right. You know, a $250,000 hovel uh, in South Auckland, which is a garage versus a $250,000 caravan, which would be the best caravan in New Zealand. You know, what is, I mean, you could even ask, what is housing? So there's three words in there that I kind of feel are, are, are relative, affordable, <laughs> quality, and housing. So if they're relative, how do we, how do we as the public understand your legislation better um, and then think about how that will be implemented, especially when it will impact us as either renters, uh, property owners, or property investors? Well, I think it's it's aspirational because it's policy. Um, it's an aspirational statement. Um, the affordable, there are, all right, so a commonly accepted metric of affordability is 30% of your income. Um, and so there's ways in which we, tr you know, the state currently tries to address that for um, some people get the um, income related rent subsidy, which, you know, they're trying to, and in other countries, they, um, they do have really concrete policies. So it is possible to do this. Like I think 25% of at least Copenhagen, I don't know if it's true on a Denmark wide basis, but 25% um, of the supply of like some of their new state developments is considered um, social housing or affordable housing. It would be accessible to a much larger a range of people than we would think of social housing here. And it might even include people who are in like essential jobs like teachers or police officers who tend not to get paid as much, but still we still need them in the central city where housing is more expensive. Um, and then quality, I mean, you know, I'll just, I'll just put my hand up and say, um, you know, passive house standard energy efficiency. <laughs> um, and, nice. uh, and, and plus the transport, don't forget the transport, like got to be very accessible to public transport and uh, walking, walking and cycling. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think we can look at examples of places, which is starting to achieve this like Vienna um, and say, you know, this is what we aspire to. And we think that every person should have access to this. So uh, what I hear you saying is a bit like you're talking about as a PK, the author, that this is aspirational, uh, meaning that says to me that this is something that the Greens are aiming to attain. But if it was to be written into legislation, it would need to be far more precise. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think there'd be different ways. I mean, we're talking about a policy, which is not one bit of a legislation, but there's different ways to achieve it. And we've got some ideas in our policy like full document about how you achieve it. Um, sorry, I thought of one other thing I wanted to say, and maybe because it's after 10, it's gone out of my head, but um, it was, um, yeah, we think all people should have, I think when it comes to quality, um, like probably the baseline would be around like warm, dry, um, uh, certain type of materials and not overcrowded. But then, of course, you could go like another like step and say, be like, all quality houses have swimming pools or something. You know, no, <laughs> pro we're probably not at that stage. Everyone has a right to a swimming pool in their backyard now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I mean, it's always it's always relative. But I mean, as a baseline, I think, you know, you'd have a, a bit of a discussion. You'd have lots of different people involved and you'd come up with it. And then it would it would evolve over time because people would you know, our knowledge would get better about how to build buildings and things like that. Yeah, we do have we, terrible we housing. We know what the minimum temperature is. I think the WHO recommends 20, 20 degrees overnight in a child's room. I and mean, I ventilation Auckland. standards, very important. We don't have them at all in New Zealand right now. I moved from Auckland to Dunedin eight years ago and left Auckland, left working in radio, looked at those two-story villas on Ponsonby Road thinking, oh, I'd love one of those $7 million houses. There's such a move to Dunedin and see those same villas and go, oh, I wouldn't fucking live in that for a $1,000. Because all I can see when in Dunedin is heating, you know, damp moisture, and I wouldn't go near it. Our housing stock is, and then, and then, this is another conversation, I guess, because in places like Dunedin over the past, it's a bit different at the moment. There hasn't seen that capital growth. You know, in Auckland, you get the capital growth and then you put that money back into the house and you make it better. In places where there aren't the capital growth, you get even worse housing stock. And so you don't 
the housing stock then doesn't improve. So I don't know. So if that that's an interesting, the interesting observation though. There isn't it that you know as as values increase, incentives increase to actually you know make it even better. So that that's why I think like this this whole kind of thinking of leveling the playing field. Just bringing it back to that that if we're trying to make it more affordable, it kind of runs contrary to making things more quality in some cases, right? Um, no, I mean, ways that you can get around this um, is like providing incentives. So for example, if you have a capital gains tax, um, then you do make improvements to the home that meet energy efficiency standards tax deductible. And so then it's actually easier to provide those incentives to make those improvements if you've got um, you've got the, the tax there. So then you can have a tax break for the for the improvements. More taxes for tax breaks. Cool. Um, it works. <laughs> let's um, jump into a few questions now because I'm a one man band here. I might just throw the question to you guys and then I might go find another question and cool. we'll see how this goes. But there have been people asking questions almost since we started. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll try and find a few of them and I'll try my best not to, you know, some enthusiastic people in the chat have asked multiple things. I'll try my best just to find one or two of them. So uh, Robbie says, asks the question directly, uh, should there be a limit a person can own residential property. Should there be a limit? A person can own residential property. Either of you is able to jump in and answer that. I, I actually personally think there there is wisdom in that, or there's wisdom, I guess, in designing some rules which makes it significantly harder for people to go beyond a certain point. Because you know, like after you've done enough for you and your own, and a little bit left over for everybody else then it's, it's like, yeah, it's kind of like what you were saying before, Julianne, it's just wealth just attracts itself. It just concentrates together. It clumps together, right? So it, it does become easier and easier for those at the very top to accumulate more and more and more and more and more. And it's more likely that those people at the very, very top are definitely not adding value. In fact, they're probably extracting value. But at the very, very low level, two or three properties, why the heck not? That's what I would say. Anything, yeah, Julianne? I'm, <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm afraid to make up Green Party policy on the hoof. Um, look, I yeah, I think. <laughs> Go for it. Do it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I I agree with the statement. Yeah, I agree that there probably should there should be limits. Um, Do you know but that that's limits not our policy. That's not yeah, our okay. policy. Our policy is more like incentives and you know taxes and. Would Would you want uh, to ban it though, Julianne? Like, would you want to ban property investment? Uh, no, look, this is a very unfair question to ask me. Um, I'd say <laughs> almost 10 30. <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't, um, I don't think that it's contributing to a, like a fair and equitable outcome for people at the moment. And I think there's different, like, I don't, I think we're very far away from being at a place where a democratic society would do that. So I don't, right. I don't think that's Let's on the not table. Let's not on any more difficult questions, shall we? Okay. More of a All comment right. here from Mary. Mary says, one house per adult person. Since there are so many single people these days, no need for people to own more than one house. Let the renters buy. So there you go. There's another common uh, comment, I should oh, here, say. Here, here's, here's the thing, though, right? Like, so... Out of, out of all the housing stock that's out there, out of all the people that live in property, right? Like it, you can't assume that if there's less property investment, that more owner occupation will happen. You can't assume that if those who sell, if property investors sell, that it will fall in the hands of those who are, because not like very, um, it's, it's kind of simplistic to assume that everybody who doesn't own a property is trying to own a property. There's actually probably not a very huge amount of the population at any given point of time that is actively looking to buy property. So the other added complication is that no one wants to catch a falling knife. If property values did all of a sudden drop to attainable levels for these first home buyers, I'd suggest that a lot of first home buyers would be freaked out and they wouldn't touch it because it's crashing. Why would you want to lose money? So it's, it's yeah, I get, I get the spirit of the question, but it's it's a bit of a an assumption to assume that that's actually what's going to happen. Another one here from Mason says, um, uh -huh. "We never get, we'll never get our housing crisis under control while we have unsustainable immigration without the resources. We've got wealthy foreigners in our homes. Meanwhile, Kiwis living in dangerous motels, tents, and cars. Developers building unaffordable units everywhere, and still a serious housing crisis." 
Um, so, um, like, but there's no immigration at the moment. Like, it's, like it's there's not any immigration at the moment. Is there any way you could leave that question up? Because I wanted to look at it. I while can. I can go back and Thanks. find it. It was kind of long. It was. Um, it was. So, and we and the government did stop foreign investment in residential property. Um, so, so I don't. I mean, like in the short term, there's not more we can do in that space. <laughs> I think the real issue is the banks loaning so much more on residential property. And um, basically uh, in was December 2019, I think they were loaning like 5 billion. And in December 2020, after COVID, they were loaning 10 billion. So they're just, they're just, they've got money to loan and, and the supply isn't increasing fast enough. So um, it creates a situation where things just, yeah, they just get bit up really fast. And um, I don't think it's sustainable at all. I think we're hugely at risk of, um, you know, because if we do, if supply catches up with demand, then prices will fall. It's yeah. really interesting to hear people say um, that they, because I mean, that's what happened in Ireland, right? I mean, they overbuilt housing and then, and then prices fell, I think, by like 25%. And it took some time to recover from that. And I think what would be really important from an equity point of view, if we did have a house price crash, would be um, that we did try to help those people who were kind of like the first home buyers who were the last ones to buy in the last year or two, you know? Totally. Um, and, but, you know, investors, oh, well, you know, take a risk. <laughs> well, but that's the, but that's the problem, isn't it? The problem, like Max Rash. Rash Brock had an article talking about there needs to be a 40% correction in the market. You know, if people, that means basically unless you have 50% equity in your house, then a 40% correction is going to cause you to go into a mortgagey sale because you're not going to, there's not going to be enough equity. Prices have increased by like more than 25% in one year. So you'd only be going back one year. So it wouldn't be very many first home buyers who bought in the last year. So I think we could afford to bail them out. I wouldn't want to bail out anyone else though. So would you, okay, so come on, let me just interject here a little bit because I think the the banks have actually been performing a function during the last eighteen months in particular, which I think is actually was by, by design. You know, most people kind of look at banks as intermediaries; they're just ticket clippers. They take money from savings, they give it to borrowers, and they they make a profit in between. But the role of banks in New Zealand probably needs to be examined. I feel probably a little bit closer so that we can actually understand their role in underpinning the New Zealand economy. Because ultimately, the every time everyone gets out of mortgage, that money, most of that money actually didn't exist before. It gets created. Yeah. So it, it, it's created by the banks. It flushes around the economy for a bit. It ends up dying in taxation and debt repayment. That's kind of how the financial system works. Surprise. So if you mess with Why that- Why do you say I'm dying gonna, in taxation? Because taxation is paying for infrastructure and goods and services. Well, you can you, you, you guys own that. Well, no, you don't own it. Next door to you is the money printer, right? So does it matter if it goes into taxation or money printer? It's just accounting. So it either way, debt repayment is or taxation is when money dies. You can say that it moves around the system, but really it's just digital numbers on a screen. But the, rea the re what I'm getting at, though, is that if you look at all of the, the things that are in place right now, I, I, I would hate to actually speak this into existence, but the likelihood of a property market correction right now is very high because of some quite significant legislation that's coming into effect on the 1st of uh, December, which will limit, I think, the supply of new money creation even more because the lending criteria is jumping up a bit. So we've had tax changes. And we've had significant increases to lending criteria and now increases to interest rates. The probability of a correction is increasing daily. And I don't think we can engineer a soft landing. So yeah, well, that's what, that's why I was saying we should, we could have engineered a soft landing earlier, but um, yeah, I think interest rates going up could be quite problematic for people who've taken on a lot of debt. Um, and that's, that will become very, very problematic if interest rates are going up. But I mean, ultimately, um, the people calling for increasing supply to address the housing crisis, like that's still going to have the same impact if you increase supply sufficiently. And I think we are going to start to catch up on that because yeah. even though there are constraints in the building material set um, area, um, there, there's record numbers of consents and there's record low net migration. So, um, you know, for the not record, but like in the last 
15 years. This is probably a record low in net migration. Yeah. 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 It's going to be an interesting time, especially in the new build space where there's, there's less disincentives at play. And so you have a lot more investors flocking now to brand new builds, which sounds good on the surface, but I kind of wonder, are they walking into a little bit of a trap, right? Because that could be potentially really impacted if there is an oversupply of new housing stock, which is geographically contained at the same time that there's a demand side shock because of all this regulation, taxation and interest rate rises. Um, I just think that we're, we're heading into a significantly higher period of risk around that than, than what we've but seen But ultimately, for a very long time. demand should be like related to the number of people. <laughs> like, you know, so like the whole point of the demand side shock on the investor side was to stop investors from crowding out people who could buy a home. And the regulation around renters is to make sure that, you know, the place is being provided for rent or quality. Um, we're not even making them affordable. Um, <laughs> Um, and and the demand, like the, there's a limit on what renters can pay um, to some extent, right? Uh, so that's sort of limited. But I do think that if the borders open up, we'll probably get a lot more population growth. There's a lot of people wanting to come home or to move to New yeah. Zealand. And so yeah. like, I think, yeah, it, it'll be kind of a bumpy pathway. But um, yeah. I just think it's important that if there was a house price crash, that uh, government had policy to ensure that um, – first home buyers weren't, you know, that we were bailing them out. So they're not underwater and in a lot of debt. Yeah. Um, they better get busy. They better get busy. Um, last comment before we give you guys a chance to wrap up, wrap up. It's uh, threads and time says my daughter and hubby with two kids have $80,000 cash deposit for a house. Wow. But can't get a mortgage because they're on minimum wage. And I think for a lot of people, what they find is it's the ability for repayments and I think, Darcy, when you were on the podcast uh, we, a while ago, we talked about this. It seems problematic to me that people who can spend two, uh, well, two, I'm talking about Danine, three, four, five, six hundred bucks a week in rent, then can't get an approval from a bank to spend four or five hundred bucks a week on a mortgage. But mm. that's uh, yeah, the, abil that's the ability to, to service the mortgage is a big part of this as well. It's not really a question, it's more of a comment from Threads in Time, but you're welcome to either of you um, mm. have a thought around it. All, all I'll say is that, yep. Yeah. Interest rates have never been this cheap and some are doing incredibly well. But what, what I see every week is a lot of people that can't do anything because while it's so cheap and it's never been so you know awesome, potentially, it's never been this hard to get. The lending criteria is incredibly restrictive. Saving for a 20% deposit, like 20% on an average house, that's phenomenal. Like, who can do that without, you know, like you say, Pat, being lucky enough to be born in a situation like that? Like that that's that's there's there's unfortunately there's no solution because the the whole system and I think regulation unfortunately needs to needs to seriously change there because that is incredibly inequitable that someone like that can't actually have a go at things. I certainly made a move with lower numbers than that with my first move, but you just can't do that anymore. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think that is a place for government policy to um you know, you could have policy specifically targeted at making sure that people are able to get into home ownership. Um, and lots of countries have had that, you know, there's people who bought their first home living in London in the eighties with that, you know, um, they qualified for a 0% down and an incredibly low interest rate um, in a, like you just have to have proactive policies to look after the people for whom it's difficult. And the restrictive lending criteria should only apply to investors. Actually, I actually agree with that. I think that's that's makes sense. Oh, people agreeing again. That's not how. Sorry, man. This is killing your debate. On. Sorry, Pat. Um, let's do this, guys. Let's say thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we've got a chance here for any closing statements. I'm not interested in doing like a. You have two minutes, and we're going to cut it off. But if either of you, not, who who started with the. Uh, Julianne, you get you gave us the first kind of introduction to yourself. So, um, let's give. Um, Darcy a chance, you know, just a, a minute or two, whatever comes yep. naturally, Darcy, if you want to whatever have any last naturally. words, and then we'll wrap up and say goodbye, and you can go have a beer yep. or a wine or a or dinner, whichever suits you. Or, 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 or a sleep, or a sleep. Yeah. No, like, again, I re really appreciate the opportunity to share like this, and really enjoyed having a chat with you, Gillian, and, and understanding a little bit more. Like, every time I catch up with people from the Green Party, I, I always end up finding that I have a lot more in common with some of the ideologies than, than what I would initially think. And I think there's some value in just kind of 
pointing that out because with something like this, the tendency is to be kind of divisive and be um, choosing left or right with these decisions. But I guess the, the main thing that I'm kind of looking forward to with hope is that somehow there'll be a mechanism for individuals, for the community to rise up and take the power back, you know, and to actually organize themselves to do good things. And yep, there's a role for government, but also I kind of think that there might be some surprises in the future with just like how, you know, Bitcoin is currently rocking the, the financial world. I think blockchain can really help stuff like this as well. So I kind of look at technology, a little bit of fringe technology now, perhaps, but I kind of see that there is a type of reg tech that might be able to wrap around to help us with solving this problem because, yeah, imperfect humans form imperfect structures, imperfect outcomes. And I think, you know, we, we're not perfect. We can't just choose the right flavor and we've discovered the solution, right? But I think facing towards solving the problem is, is what we need to be doing. Cool. Julianne? Yeah, thank you so much, Tracy. I really enjoyed uh, being on this um, podcast, Pat. It was really uh, interesting and fantastic to have an opportunity to have like a civilized discussion, nuanced discussion, which we so rarely get these days. Um, I was just thinking about your comments, Darcy, um, I think it was Noam Chomsky or someone who said like in an yeah. ideal world, I'd be an anarchist, but in the world <laughs> as it is, I'm like a democratic socialist. And I think yeah. I went on a similar path. So I understand the mistrust of, um, an overly bureaucratic state, but I also like, I guess where I come from is well, we can fix this. We can make it better. We can make it more responsive to people and we can um, devolve some of this public good stuff to a, the third sector, like an NGO, not for profit um, or um, social enterprise um, sector. But um, it's really, yeah, I do think that um, that government and regulation and taxation and all of that is really necessary in order to support that. Um, and I am. I feel like we have very similar analysis of what's going on with the housing market, and it's a little bit scary. But um, I'm also really optimistic about what could be achieved. Can I? My closing statement is: I saw this proposal for a developer-led, private developer-led proposal for a car-free neighbor suburb with 5,000 homes, two schools, shops, commercial space um, in Auckland, and I was so happy to see it. I haven't seen anything like that proposed in New Zealand. It's been done in Germany like 20 years ago. It's awesome. It works really well. <laughs> but that was a publicly led process. And here it's actually um, a private developer who's proposing it, which I think is probably going to make it more likely to be successful and taken seriously in the short term. Awesome. Guys, this has been an absolute blast. Let me just say uh, to people who are uh, watching still, congratulations on still watching. If you want to find out more about us and, and what people are about, um, I'm, I don't know why I'm using Facebook. Everyone's got all the social medias. Uh, Julianne Genta on uh, Facebook. Also, check out Darcy's podcast, the NZ Everyday Investor podcast. And uh, because we're starting this up fresh and new, uh, head yourself along there and like the Elephant TV. You can see the logo there. Uh, he's got the little... The little uh, test pattern under TV, the Elephant TV, go and uh, like that page and then that will uh, let you know when the next lot of uh, debates or conversations or whatever are coming up. And as you see scrolling along the bottom of the screen, the other place you can find us is uh, DOC NZ Studios, which is YouTube, which also carries the other content we make, like the podcast that I referred to a couple of times. But that's us. Hey guys, oh, look, a genuine thank you so much for coming on and doing the first one. I know uh, especially for you, Julianne, that there's probably some, you know, some things you get invited to that you're not too sure about. Um, but for trusting enough to jump on board and have a bit of a chat with us, uh, and and I think what we've done is set a pretty fantastic benchmark for uh, for these to come. It's as as you said, it's a it's a it's a, we're, we're sane and we're having intelligent conversations and we're not doing it by screaming at each other and all that. My last question to you, Julianne, before we leave is, um, you're are you the COVID spokesperson for the Greens? Yes. Okay. So when am I going to be able to go get my beard trimmed? That's all I really want to know. From <laughs> That's all I want. I want to know that too. Actually, level, I need level one to go and get my beard trimmed so I can look less homeless. When is? I'm just kidding. You don't have to really? I, I swear I thought I saw beard trimmers operating in Wellington. You have to have your mask too. on inside in a public in a public thing. So how do they do it? You got, mm -hmm. I'm not complaining. I think, I think the hairdresser has to have a mask, but oh, okay, maybe you're I'll right. Read, I'm I'll, not I'm sorry. Not, I should know this. 
I'm not, I'm not in the you, government now, so I'm not a government should, spokesperson. You should know the important things, like when beard trimming is coming back. I'm not. I'm not complaining about it. I'm just observing it. Hey, thank you guys so much for coming in. Thank you for people who have uh, joined in and jumped in there and chatted. I can see the Facebook page has gone a bit, uh, bit bananas. And um, if you've enjoyed what you've seen, like the Facebook page, uh, go and subscribe to the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, spread this around. Obviously, this will be now on demand for people. They can watch it. Uh, you know, now that we've finished it, and um, I'll just say thanks to you two in particular, Darcy and Julianne, and thanks to everyone for watching. It's been a blast. Cool. Thanks, guys. Bye.